Hello, everyone. Welcome to this panel, where we'll be discussing how to influence developer productivity through tech products. We have an accomplished set of panelists. Oh, I think collectively we are like 80 plus years of experience in tech product, all women, so shout out to that. And um, we will, I'm sure many of you have delved into this topic and have opinions about it. So while we go through a set of pre canned questions, feel free to chime in. It's really an informal discussion. Um, I'll start with my introduction. My name is Neetu Chan. I'm an executive director at JP Morgan Chase where I look at cloud network security products, provide them as a service, infrastructure as a service, to all lines of businesses at JPMC. Um, my products being network, we are the first one to go in into cloud for a cloud transformation journey, and we're the last one to come out whenever we exit. So you can imagine how crucial they are in any improvements there, how massive impact they have on productivity. Prior to this role, I have I started my career as an engineer and did EDA products and network security products. And after about a decade, I decided to move into product management. Most of my products until now, until then, were B2C and B2D products or B2B products, sorry, but business facing or customer facing products. It was at when I moved from IBM to USA, I actually moved into SDLC products. That's where I realized now it's not about market share or you know revenue. Uh, it was more about now productivity and agility and cost optimization because for the first time I was managing in products that were internal facing IT products um, and how I was indirectly serving the customers. So that's when I started getting interested in this topic of where you change the holy grail of developer productivity uh, to expedite your cloud transformation journey. I'll stop now and we'll dive deeper into this topic, but I'll let other panelists introduce themselves. <laughs> Thank you. Very happy to see you all, and I'm Janani Rajendran. I'm a principal product manager at uh, Quiet AI. It's a startup company in the application security space. So if any of you deal with uh, Static analysis tool or SCA, open source vulnerability tools, then do check us out. Uh, we were formerly called Shift Left. I think that might be a much more uh, familiar name that you'll recognize. We're just going through a rebranding. So that's quite AI. Anyhow, so I started out as a developer, right? That's where I spent most of my career as a developer. And then uh, past four years, I switched to product management. All right, one thing. Um, you know, um, it's pretty exciting for me here when we're talking about developer productivity, right? We, uh, as an organization, my previous roles, we had adopted the OKR framework. Um, I know, yet another framework, right? But it's all about implementing it, right? The devil is in the details. So anyhow, so the one thing that I was really excited about the OKR framework is uh, it was a good tool, especially for breaking the silos, getting an alignment, and visibility across the organization, right? Um, an organization could be any person, anything with more than one person, right? More than one person, we need to have visibility and alignment. That's where I define it. Um, so that's how I got started, and that's how me and Neetu got interested in this topic, and we want to discuss. So. Interesting fact: we started our career journeys together at the same company many years ago. We're not saying the number of years, right? <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Samantha Carvalho. I'm a senior technical program manager um, at Developer Experience Group at Roku. And um, I, like esteemed colleagues, uh, you know, have been a developer most of my career, uh, recent foray into program management. I started off at Netflix, uh, where you know, there was lots of initiatives with the spin spinnaker and things like that, and it lended itself really well, uh, being an engineer, you're trying to optimize your stuff. You know, you want to push code faster, you want to deploy faster, you want to have tests running, all passing, and making that process easy. So it lends itself very much uh, towards being productive, things that you do for yourself and for your team as a whole. So very passionate about this, about this space. 
And currently at Roku, we're trying to move the needle on developer productivity. And some of the initiatives that we've recently started is like uh, the, implementing more rigorous CICD shift left initiatives, which is different than quiet AI. But it means you know having test more upstream versions of tests or even post-merge um, test automation firms. So that's where we're trying to move the needle towards developer productivity at Roku. And I am Tracy Reagan. I am the CEO of a company called Deploy Hub. I am uh, pretty busy around the Linux Foundation. I am on the CDF TOC. I served on the board of the Open Source Security Foundation. I helped start the Eclipse Foundation. I helped start the CD Foundation. Um, my background is also a developer. I started, I cut my teeth on Wall Street working on, uh, on mainframe systems. And something called OS2 came out. I got really excited about it until I found out I had to write my own compile JCL. And I was like, what? You have to write your own compile JCL? You have to, you have to write your own processors to do deployment? How stupid is that? <laughs> and I have been saying that for the last almost 30 years, to be quite honest. Um, and so to me, developer productivity has, was sorted out on the mainframe. I discovered that we had a lot of work to do on what they called the open systems as soon as I started trying to deliver my OS2 code. And I, to this day, I'm still preaching that. To this day, I'm still preaching, why are you writing these scripts, people? <laughs> why are we doing that? Um, I'm a big fan of CD events, which really speaks to this particular problem in the DevOps space. Um, we have some folks here that are on the, uh, we have Andrea Picholi who is on the CD events team. Um, so uh, while you're here, please, please learn about CD events. And I'm also a community organizer for Artilius, which gathers data. Okay, I'm gonna start the ball rolling with the first question. So um, based on your experience, how have you folks um, measured impact of your products? And my follow up question is that, Given these metrics, how have you involved the developer community in collecting these metrics and how has it become a collaborative sport? Okay, so I'll share my experience when at a previous employer I was providing a platform as a service which was basically meant to be used by the developers of the company to push their code to cloud. Um, there we initially, and this was before Dora came out, Dora Matrix came out, and intuitively, we had divided our matrix into agility matrix, which involved velocity, code to deploy, lines of code, et cetera, matrix, and then security matrix, quality matrix, and reliability matrix. We had basically, at a high level, these metrics. And then we realized as we started using these metrics, some of these were output matrix, not really outcome matrix. So we started diving deeper into it. It's around the same time when Dora Matrix came out and we adopted them more religiously. And over the course of time, we improved our matrix or KPIs, et cetera, to focus more on the outcomes. Their lines of code might not be, but what is the value at deployment, you know, and what's the cycle time? These were all developer matrix. After that, after SDLC products, I also worked in InsureTech and MarTech where we had different metrics, but they were also internal products driving productivity. And there it was claim adjustment cycle time in insurance claim work. Uh, it was about number of tasks and steps reduced to automation. You know, In MarTech, it was about measuring breaking down of literally silos when there's a lead with sales and then marketing is pursuing it when they are actually converting and not and when customer retention can really retain it when there's a flag. These all become different metrics that we would track depending on use case to use case. But I think the common theme was tracking, uh, getting sidelined by whatever metrics we have instead of finding what are the metrics that we want to drive, where do we want to move the needle on to, to focus there, focus towards moving the needle, OKRs, and North Star, finding a North Star between the noise of metrics. That's became our focus. <laughs> I think it works. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, so I started out as I said as a developer. So in my previous organization, yes, we used to have something called waterfall. I hope you all remember that, right? Uh, so yes. Yeah, so that's where I started my developer journey with waterfall, and where developer productivity is all about LOC, line of code, and number of uh, bugs you're fixing, 
right? That's how the developer productivity was measured then. And then we, of course, like everyone else, we adopted to Agile, and then it just switched to number of story points you're doing, right? That's how it was being measured. But anyhow, uh, eventually, right, we, um, we evolved, and we moved to a SaaS product. We adopted DevOps principles, and then, uh, and then, as I mentioned before, we took on the OKR framework. So that, um, so that one really helped uh, in in having, you know, measuring the developer productivity in the right way. Which I think, right? As developers, we all take great pride in our work, and we want to work on the right priorities, right? Which makes an impact, right? We want to use, we want to make, right, do something that everybody is using it. Right, so, so that's where the OKR framework helped, which is like, you know, all the stakeholders, the leaders, right? It's just not the PLMs who are defining it and then, you know, handing it over to the developer team or to the ops team, right? It is, it is a collaborative effort, and we define, uh, you know, very specific metrics, right? Very specific key measures that we want to focus on for that quarter. So for example, a specific quarter, we were, you know, we just wanted to focus on uh, increasing the customer adoption from stage two to stage three in our onboarding funnel, right? That was a specific uh, objective for that quarter, and we identified three key measures for it, right, along with my development uh, team. And then we had it, we had a dashboard set up, all the Slack, all the different integrations, wherever the developers are there, right? And then we had that visibility, right? So when a developer, when they check in some feature or check in a code, right, they get to see the impact it's making, right, with those key measures. So, so that, um, you know, that was, that really helped, uh, you know, and I, at that time I was not a developer, but when I spoke to my development team, they really, um, they appreciated that visibility that they're getting, right, from their work, from their code, to the business impact it's creating. Um, it's, it's all about the data, right? So metrics, we're talking about data, KPIs, OKRs, it's all about the data. So when you have an opportunity to build something, think about factoring in how you can collect your data, and that's something unique. They think that we've started to instill in our process. When we come up with a feature guide, we're like, oh, you need KPIs. How are you gonna collect that data? So we've incorporated it up as part of our feature guide. Now you must be asking yourself, oh, but then development time for the feature and then development time for the data. Yes, that's true, it would increase that time, but hopefully you're thinking about building telemetry that doesn't extend to one feature, but could be used by multiple services. You know, single storage for logs, you know, able to grab something, or it, it could be even simple things. So the, 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 the measurement should be you know, having machines collect this data and cycle the data and, and give you the answers, not like looking at processes and scripts and things like that. So useful data, it's about how you collect the data, what data you collect. And, and some of, sometimes, you know, when we, we haven't had the opportunity to build in this um, telemetry from, from tooling, we've, we've resorted to having um, surveys or, you know, working with focused user groups, um, just key people that, you know, where we're like, okay, this is what we want to collect, this is how we're thinking about collecting it, what are your thoughts, you know, what, what do you think we could do to measure this, this process for, for a particular feature? So that's, that's our, how we've sort of approached it. I guess we've come a long way, right, in collecting data and, and in KPIs. Um, I think that some of the first ones I can remember of course, it was how many lines of code, right? <laughs> how many lines of code? And um, I can also remember um, a KPI of a rubber chicken sitting on my desk because I broke the build. <laughs> and I would tell him, well, I wouldn't break the build if you didn't ask me to write so many lines of code. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I'm getting paid. So I would make my code really big. <laughs> but I think that, uh, really, I think Git has changed us in the way we track a lot of data. And I think that Git still can be, um, we can actually uh, leverage the Git data even more than what we already have. And I think that Git, what Git did for all of us was centralize all this information in one place, and as we're talking about, data is the key, right? Um, at, to track those metrics. Uh, Linux Foundation, LFX Tools, they have some interesting uh, tools that sits on top of the Git data. It has, you can get um, LFX Insights that gives you some really good information. And the thing about when you start using the data and you start measuring your metrics, developers start measuring their own. 
And that is where we really need to get, where developers have, have, can self-service themselves. They start understanding how well they're, they're performing against others. And I think Git has done that. I mean, even today when we do, when the CD Foundation does voting, it's based on how many commits that you're, have you done, how much progress have you made, how much, how, are you a doer? And that kind of data becomes critical. I think that some other KPIs that we have looked at in the past that I think are maybe getting a little long in the tooth are the door metrics. We talk about door metrics often, um, but door metrics may be kind of like how many lines of code, especially as we move into decoupled environments and microservices. Um, salsa is something that maybe we should be looking at, and salsa is a practice, but potentially we could create some met salsa metrics uh, so that we can start improving um, beyond where we, are, wh where we came from. Uh, but I really believe the key is for developers to be able to have that information right in front of them. I know from my own perspective, I want to know how well I'm performing and I want to always do better. So the more information I can get about myself, I improve myself. And so I feel like metrics need to be uh, more self-service self and kind of in every developer space. Yes, I think the key, I think all of us would agree, right? It's a developer empowerment, right? It's just not, um, you know, it's not coming top down. It's the um, developers feeling empowered to do that. Yeah. Okay. So I know we just discussed about, okay, how we make, how we ideas to how we measure developer productivity. Okay. Let's get to the meat of the problem, which is, you know, what challenges we have faced, right? And in, um, in adopting these ways to measure the developer productivity. Right, let me kick off by saying that, um, right, and yes, we always heard this uh, phrase that change is constant, right, but in organization, um, it's not, right? It, yes, it's constant, but there is so much of, um, you know, it's not easy to bring about a change. There is a lot of resistance, especially anything that touches the developer tools or environment, right? There is resistance. So how did we go about it, right? Um, one example, again, continuing on the OKR example that I've been talking about, right? Um, so the key thing, what we, uh, what we started out in the organization was just start small, right? We, so we started out with a small feature or a product that was just moving from POC to, um, you know, it's becoming a product. So that one, we started out small, we define those, you know, the OKR metrics that I mentioned about. And then, you know, once we uh, saw the value of it, right, the team and the developers became the champion of it, right? And other teams started to, you know, see the value of it, right? What was shared by this, um, you know, this champion team's experience. So it became more of the team owning it rather than it being forcing down, right? So forced adoption. So. I, I think that's, that was the key for us to bring out, bring up this new change in measuring the productivity. Sounds about right. I'll share more, new, like if we double click into OKRs and all that, I'll share my experiences with, with this topic. So as I already touched upon, there was this problem of output matrix and outcome matrix. When we started, driving the OKRs, that what is exactly the objectives, what is the key results, it became very clear that adoption was not taken into account, especially with IT products. You know, most of the matrix were just go, deploy, provide that feature, release that feature. And most of the timelines of the OKR, the key results were about that delivery, instead of why are you doing this? Why are you releasing it? What is the end result that you want to achieve? So I started diving deeper into why is that? And it turned out there were a couple of things that were preventing us from getting into the real objective and the key results. One was cross dependencies. Oftentimes when we were releasing something, there were many other cross dependencies that will have to come together to ultimately you know, go to customer's hand and customers will adopt it and actually we can see the needle moving. So this cross dependencies was making everybody feel nervous. Like I've done my part, what if they don't do that, their part and then I get dinged for the OKR, you know? The other was actually the culture of, I guess, resistant to failure. Um, in CICD, we're supposed to fail fast, chip and learn, chip and learn. 
but still, if it gets tied to the performance of the engineering team, so the engineering team was hesitant to put that on their OKR as a matrix because they feel they've done their best. They are external, like, first of all, adoption. There was another team driving cloud adoption that was responsible for adoption. And then there were other dependencies, you know, so they didn't feel like they need to share the burden of failing on this OKR and, you know, them impacting their, and that OKR impacting their performance. So it was an intricate game. Um, and on top of that, I agree, as Samantha touched, there is extra effort needed to build the telemetry in. So your feature delivery will get delayed in an agile fashion where you want to meet, I delivered X features over this time. Oftentimes, telemetry is, you know, pushed under the carpet and, you know, sacrificed. Um, I'd like to extend uh, something that Janani said. So um, getting developers to change is hard, and we acknowledge that that's a problem. You know, they're used to doing things a certain way, and they're like, okay, things are working just fine. Why should I adopt this new process? So we started at grassroots, right? We're like, okay, we're gonna you know, get a set of ambassadors to our new process change and get the buy-in there, you know, prove a POC, work with them, uh, get them to be advocates, you know, sh show that the POC works and then have the developers be the advocates. And so we call them ambassadors because they're gonna speak towards us. After we get that buy-in from the developer community, then we go to higher level management and say, you know, this is, they, they seem to be happy with this, this group of folks, you know, and we are seeing this work, um, you know, do you get buy-in? And some of these people will be in the same orgs, and so you have now two groups, uh, you know, and we've seen that process seem to work better. I mean, it's, it's not a panacea for everything, but, you know, it seems to be like both groups are, uh, you know, gelling, and it's not like from one group saying, oh, this is how you do things, now do it. No, it's like both sets of groups are talking, uh, and you, you feel that they're part of the conversation. So that's, a, that's potentially a way that could, we've seen success in, in some of affecting change in a positive way. And obviously there are gonna be naysayers, that there has to be, that you have to prove someone wrong somewhere down the pipeline. So you know, it, when, when the product ships or you see these and you collect it, it um, I, I don't know if someone highlighted, you only see that change or that net positive effect after it's released. So, you have to wait a while to get that data and then prove that, you know, yes, this was successful. Would you come on board for the next initiative? <laughs> um, so that being said, there are certain industries also that we know about, like, you know, uh, if you're doing finance or if you're doing healthcare or um, even uh, when you're doing in a chip industry, there's different levels of productivity in each of those things. You'll have audit trails, you'll have security, you have compliance, which normally in certain you know, web-based applications, you don't have to think about those. So depending on your industry, you're having a different set of problems, a different set of challenges, but it's just about thinking about those things, not that they can be solved, but you know, thinking about those things up front in, in, at a different angle, yeah. Yeah, and I think when I look at, because I work in the open source world and I work in enterprise and I have a small company, and I look at those three kind of cultures, open source innovates really fast. Yeah. And why is that? And why I think it is, is because they're not afraid of failure. Failure is not a bad thing. Failing slow is a disaster. <laughs> what we have to learn to do and what the open source community does really well is they fail fast. Uh, they fail almost, it's like, it's so immediate when we realize that we went down the wrong road. It, we don't, it, it doesn't take us long to figure it out. Op I think enterprise um, organizations should really embrace the idea of failing fast. And as we, you know, we, we, we had a discussion about the champion and doing things faster. The reason why you have a champion team is because they figured out how to fail fast. That's why you have a champion team. And that champion team then teaches everybody as a mentor, right? So mentoring is important too to change the culture. But failure is so scary for some people. And a lot of our open source contributors, when they first start, they're afraid to do a pull request. They're afraid to check something in because they're afraid to fail. And we tell them, please, please, I challenge you to break it. Break it, we don't care. It, we, everything can be fixed. And I believe in the enterprise world that that culture um, needs to be fostered. Yeah. Um, yes. 
Yeah. I believe that we are in a um, state of transition here, and one of the things that's driving it is moving away from a monolithic application. Um, microservices are uh, going to change the, a lot of things. Um, in particular, we're, we're gonna be building Lego sets, right, that you can use different pieces and parts, not just from within your organization, but you might be, you might be buying a set of microservices, right, or you might be borrowing open source ones. And I believe that once we stop thinking about ourselves as application silos, and instead, instead we have feature teams, mm -hmm. that we're gonna think more like an open source community. And I think, I believe our tooling will be disrupted pretty big because of that. Yeah, I feel like almost enterprises were some commonplaces for such a long time. They couldn't figure out a way to stick you know, a, an indicator or a measurement on it to promote it, right? Yeah, you don't. When, when does modularity become a first class citizen, right? I, I applaud you. The, you don't want to get me started on object-oriented programming and the failures there because that was the perfect, we, we're doing it all over again. Microservices are object-oriented programming, basically, and we just don't have one massive build and libraries to link together. Uh, but we're still consuming each other's products, and it's more obvious that we are. Ownership of those microservices, who created them, what's in them, all of that becomes um, more important in the process, and, and, th and it's, more op it's more open source-like. So the enterprise, I think, is starting to act more like open source. Let's hope so. I, I'm seeing it, right, in my previous roles, right? As I said, I started out in Waterfall, where we had releases every two years, right? You've, checked, you've done a feature and you forgot all about it by the time the customer adopted and opened a bug. It's like, what, did I write that piece of code two years ago? <laughs> Who knows, right? But then with the adoption of DevOps, right, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm very positive that it, you know the change is happening, right? Maybe as not as fast as we want, but I definitely see a change, right? Uh, because I've been in, uh, in one of my previous organizations for 14 years, so I've seen the dinosaur developers evolving, changing, and moving on to the DevOps and adopting it, right? And they say, you know, developers are amazing. I mean, we have a lot of pride in the work we do, right? So we want to see the value it's creating, right? So, so I, and, and I think we all have enough experience to feel empowered and challenge these old metrics and old way of things, right? That's been happening. I'm good. Yeah. So, what do you think are the barriers to adoption of these all these cool new tech products that claim to improve productivity, but they're still barriers? What I I'll share my experience. One is upskilling. There's so many new things coming out. Developers have to upskill, apart from bus their business as usual roles and responsibilities. There's not enough time, and then, as we already touched, the fear of failure. But you guys want to take a dig at it? Well, I think that, you know, when you have a flood of new tools hit the market, <laughs> it's really hard to understand which ones you're supposed to be using. Right. And we're facing that, right, especially around the security tooling. There's all, you know, you, we are, we are, we are, we're like the little kid who just likes to look at the shiny new object, and we run to the shiny new object, and we run to the shiny new object. But right now, we have so many shiny new objects that it's extremely confusing. Um, there's really no easy way to solve that problem. Um, it, it requires a lot of time and consideration. Uh, most, I think a lot of larger organizations I see have somebody who's trying to look at all the shiny new objects and decide which ones that they should add to their list of tools to use. I sometimes think that is stifling because another, new, another shiny object comes in to, to replace that. 
But innovation is, can, be, can be hard to foster, and it goes back to the failing fast. If our organizations would allow more tools to come into the process, and then you find out which ones float to the top, then uh, these new tool, the new tooling that's coming in will have a better adoption uh, process. And I think that tool vendors like Deploy Hub and Open Source Project like Ortilius or any of them, we need to do a better job of providing our customers an easy on-ramp for these tools. Whether it be in a SaaS environment or things that are already set up to be testing easy, to, to, to test it out. POCs can be way too long. And seriously, how many people here were using Jenkins and did a POC? Okay, how many, <laughs> two. How many people have used Jenkins in their organization? Yeah, all of you. So that's my point. POCs aren't necessarily a good thing. Let a team go try it out, and if it really works well for them, let them tell the world about it. It's kind of like our other, you know, the champion team, right? Let the champion team that found the tool and started using it. That's what I think. Interestingly, at one of my previous employer, that's the role I had. I had the role of strategic innovation director, and I got to play with cool new emerging technologies and try to understand how to use that technology in the insurance world, in the claim space. I had a lot of fun in that job, you know. But the only problem was a lot of my POCs did not go to production <laughs> because of lack of resources, et cetera. So let's, let's talk about the future. Um, what's beyond developer productivity? What are the other industries? And what is the future of influencing productivity? So I'll go ahead and share mine. So I, as I shared with my experience, for a long time I did B2B, B2C products, and then internal products. I started with SDLC products that changed the developer world. But after that, I went into the insure tech and martech world, and I've been observing a lot more how traditional, traditionally manual intensive industries are being transformed. For example, insurance. You know, people like you can go and visit a house on Zillow with 3D point mapping, you know, and you can actually walk into the house. That's a great example. You can already see how MarTech has become such a big thing now. Marketing knows everything about you, sometimes even more than what you, <laughs> what they need to know, and e even what you're thinking. So to me, that is interesting in that now they are so powerful tech products where know your customer is a thing, and it is not only just changing the developer world, but also the legacy, or probably legacy is not the right word, but traditional in industries where, where they're not used to using technology as much, but they're now becoming more and more tech savvy. Some of the, in my experience of working in, in, in the finance world, some of the, um, they're very process driven and, and they're meant to be, these industries, healthcare, you know, privacy, security, compliance. So um, in dealing with developer productivity, they're just, from our, our, my past experience, there's a finite set of problems, and you look at the big picture and you try and solve as many of them as possible. You, you can't do it all, because there needs to be a human there to approve things, and that you need those audit controls. But you look at the tangible things where you could optimize, and it could be you know, automated uh, review processes for external auditors, you know, deploy times that we could, initially we, we automated using CI, CD, which we even, um, got the auditors to approve because we showed them the process. So we, we look towards, we look towards innovation. Yes, they are slower than other industries in, uh, in absorbing, but it's a matter of um, seeing what can be, you know, what, what controls can be put in place and, and, and seeing the applicability and, and tackling each one as a, a finite set of problems without trying to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. It's going to be just like, you know, push a button and everything's going to be fantastic. It, it's not real. Uh, not in, in certain industries where you have all these constraints. Um, and, and going forward, even more forward, I mean, not, not those industries, but AI is like, you know, ChatGPT, BARD, I mean, those, those are cool new shiny tools, right? And they, they could be awesome for, for developer productivity. I mean, once you're not sharing your training data with the rest of the world, uh, but, you know, there's, you know, once the organizations figure out how to get a, um, their enterprise model, but like, think about it. Uh, someone mentioned in the keynote, you know, writing Doxygen docs, or you know, templates for unit tests. I mean, how cool, cool would that be if they just started those out and you have the basic ones? 
doesn't eliminate a, a developer's job. Someone still needs to go look at those tests, fill in the things, and you know, the, but it just makes it easier to, as a stepping stone, to get into the right path. Yeah, I've been, I, I, I played with Copilot. Have, have you played with Copilot yet? It's kind of okay. cool, right? It's, yeah. it's really fun. And yeah. think about it, they, they query, they go pull all this data out of the GitHub, out of all the open source projects to generate that code. Um, imagine that for developer productivity. And also imagine that for people coming out of university. Uh, you could literally have a two-year uh, programming uh, certification at a junior junior college and use Copilot to be doing pretty good. So I think that the future is going to have a lot of AI and we're gonna see a lot of, we don't have to write every line of code and yeah. we're gonna borrow microservices from each other and it's gonna be a very different, it's gonna be a big Lego set. That's what I really believe. We're gonna be putting together our Legos. Any questions from the audience? What has your experience been around matrix and productivity, OKRs? Work in progress. <laughs> yeah. Work in progress. It is As for all with of all us. of us. It, it never stops. Us. It never stops, doesn't matter where you are. Yeah, it never stops. Sure. Tracy, we have to do it next year and see what where we stand. Oh, one right? year later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Come back on the stage. One year later and see where we are. Yeah, see yes. where we are. We've moved, we, moved the needle. Yes, maybe a little. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I know we are standing between lunch and you. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you for a lot staying. for coming. Yes. And, um, and good luck. Yeah. Thank Failing you all. Fast. Yeah. <laughs>